Brilliant. Well, uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us wherever you're joining us from in the UK or uh, elsewhere in the world. Thank you for taking the time out to uh, join us for this webinar. Hopefully, uh, you find it very informative. Um, like Ian says, if you want to just pop some questions in the chat um, to pre notify us, but there will be time at the end uh, for, for those. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Make sure that. Okay, so uh, today's talk is going to be about canine intervertebral disc disease. The title of the project um, that we're undertaking here at Cambridge is Canine Intervertebral Disc Disease. What is it and, and how much do we know? But the kind of specific part that I want to talk to you today about is the part that's up and running at the moment. Some of you may have heard about it on our Facebook pages or on, our, on the university's website or uh, the Depths and Breed Council website. And that's the recovery of ambulation in medically managed non-ambulatory small breed dogs with thoracolumbar intervertebral disc herniation. And that sounds like a very long, complicated title, um, but hopefully by the end of this webinar, you will uh, know exactly what all of that means and, and know what we're looking for. What I want to do today is just per first of all start by uh, talking to you a little bit about what intervertebral disc disease actually is, and then we'll talk more specifically about what we're doing. And then at the end, a little bit about future research and stuff that's coming up in the near future. So what is a disc? Uh, it sounds very, very simple, but essentially each of the your spine is, is split up into vertebrae. They're like little building blocks uh, and they're each their own sort of unit. Um, and as your spine bends and things like that, if you had nothing in between them, they would cause damage to themselves. They wouldn't be able to move so successfully. They wouldn't be able to provide you with such a great range of motion. Uh, and so the body's been very, very clever and it's put in between there little shock absorbers. Um, so that every time you bend, they absorb that force, they transmit it so that it doesn't cause any damage, but also allows you to have that nice full range of motion. And that's what the intervertebral disc is. So you have one in between each and every vertebra. It has two parts, an outer bit, which is really tough, it's really fibrous, um, and it essentially is there to hold the, uh, the other part, the more important functional part, in place and that's the inner part and that's much like a gel it's got a lot of water in there and that's what gives the intervertebral disc its shock absorbing capacity um, and that's the kind of bit that we're most interested in so i've put two pictures there the one on the left is uh, a picture of a vertebra um, looking end on so you can see from the label in the, in the middle there, we've got the spinal cord and then sat below that, we have the intervertebral disc. And you can see there, they label both parts of it, the outer part, the fibrous bit, which is called the annulus fibrosis. But essentially that's just the outer sort of capsule, if you like. And the inner bit, the nucleus pulposus, which is the, the squidgy bit that gives it its shock absorbing capacity. Now, I know it seems really odd that I've put a donut there, um, it's not just because I like donuts, it's not just because I'm hungry. It's actually a very, very good analogy for an intervertebral disc. If you think about it, a donut has an outer coating and a gel-like inner jam. Uh, and we're going to return back to this metaphor because it actually is a pretty good metaphor even further down the line when we're thinking about how things tend to go wrong. So. What happens when it goes wrong? It's all very well having intervertebral discs doing their job, being nice little shock absorbers, but as many of us know, that's not always the case. Sometimes we have problems associated with them. What happens is as a dog gets older, the discs start to degenerate. And what that means is that inner gel-like component starts to become harder. And it can become calcified too. And when it does that, it's less able to absorb those forces. It's less successful at 
being a shock absorber. Um, and that's kind of how the whole process begins. And this is where we end up. So I said we'd return back to the donut and essentially that's, that, that's it. So if you imagine a donut, a freshly baked donut, it's nice and soft, you can squeeze it a little bit, the jam doesn't come out, it springs right back up to where it was at the beginning. However, think about it if we leave our donut, don't eat it, sit it on the side in the kitchen, leave it there for several days, allow it to become crusty. The outer bit becomes quite hard and crusty, but the jam on the inside also becomes quite crystallized. And then if you even touch the disc a little bit or the, 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 uh, the donut in this case, you can get the jam coming squeezing out uh, as hopefully this picture has demonstrated quite nicely for you. Um, before we go any further, uh, I just wanted to speak a little bit about terminology. I spent a little bit of time looking at all the various different resources that are out there uh, um, that are available for, for everyone to read. And I think it's important that we first of all think about terminology to make it clear exactly what we're referring to at each point in time because often words are used almost interchangeably when in fact they, they, they shouldn't be. Uh, so first of all, I wanna start with intervertebral disc disease. This is probably the, the one that we hear most commonly. And intervertebral disc disease is actually an umbrella term. It covers a whole range of things. It basically covers any process, any problem associated with disc degeneration. So that could be anything from uh, discogenic pain, so pain associated with the disc, to uh, disc herniations that we'll talk about a little bit later where parts of the disc come and compress the spinal cord and things like that. So it's an overall umbrella term. Intervertebral disc herniation is the next one I wanna talk about, uh, IVDH. And again, this is kind of an umbrella term, but it's a little bit more specific than intervertebral disc disease. So some of you may know that a hernia is basically where something pokes out from where it's supposed to be sitting into another sort of space. Uh, and that's exactly what intervertebral disc herniation is. It's any time that any part of the intervertebral disc, whether that be the outer fibrous part or the inner gel-like part, pokes into the spinal canal where the spinal cord runs or is squeezed out into there. And there's lots and lots of different types of intervertebral disc herniation. We don't need to worry about all the different types, but just so that everyone's aware that it is a little bit of an umbrella term. Intervertebral disc extrusions, and this is the one we're gonna kind of focus on today. It's the one that we're most interested in. It's the one that's most relevant um, to, 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 to Daxons. Um, and this is where the inner part, the inner nucleus pulposus, that gel-like inner part is squeezed out, where it's become degenerate over time and then has become squeezed out. And then it collides with the spinal cord. A lot of people like to describe it like I do, like a jam donut, but you'll also hear some people talk about it as like toothpaste being squeezed out. Uh, it either is fine, either is appropriate, but that's what we mean when we mean an intervertebral disc extrusion. Okay, so these are the terms I'm going to use um, pretty much for the rest of the, the webinar. Also, conservative and medical management. These are interchangeable terms that you'll see written in a lot of different places. And essentially, they refer to any non surgical management. I mean, that's the same for any disease we would call it conservative or medic medical management. But it's just important to note that these are interchangeable terms. So whenever you hear one or the other, it just means the same thing. There's no different type of protocol for one and different for the other. And in our case, that usually consists of pain relief, a lot of rest, physiotherapy, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Here I wanted to just illustrate straight so one on the left is an intervertebral disc protrusion don't worry about that too much um, but the one on the right is the one that we're interested in this is a 
slightly less metaphorical way of demonstrating it's it's a bit more accurate than the jam donut analogy but as you can see the uh, middle bit of that disc that gel like pink bit has been squeezed out the top uh, and is compressing that spinal cord which is in yellow there so more specifically intervertebral disc extrusions as i've said before what where this all starts is with intervertebral disc degeneration. So where that middle bit of the disc becomes less gel, like it becomes hardened and less of a good shock absorber. And that then has the potential to be squeezed out or explode out. And that then collides with the spinal cord. So the spinal cord sits above the intervertebral disc in the spinal canal. And it's got nowhere that it can really go to move out of the way. This sort of event causes two different types of trauma to the spinal cord. So the first thing it does is it bruises it. it, it that's called a contusion. And the second thing it does is it sits there and it compresses it. The important thing to think about is that each individual intervertebral disc extrusion is a unique combination of these. So in the same dog who has two different intervertebral disc extrusions, it will be a different combination of each of these things causing their clinical signs. Every single episode, every single dog, every single intervertebral disc extrusion is unique in the degree to which each of these is causing its problem. A little bit of a schematic at the bottom. Um, I like a picture. From the left, we've got that initial kind of hitting of the spinal cord causing a bruise and then being squeezed afterwards because the spinal cord has nowhere else to go. Who gets them and, and what does it look like? We'll start with who gets them. So the most affected dogs are chondrodystrophic dogs. It can happen to any dog, um, but certainly chondrodystrophic dogs are the most overrepresented. Uh, and if you think about uh, small long dogs then you won't be far off um, with your definition of chondrodystrophic. So certainly Dachshunds, Mini Dachshunds, but also Cocker Spaniels, Corgis, Basset Hounds, these are all chondrodystrophic dogs who would generally be accepted to be slightly more at risk of intervertebral disc extrusion than uh, a different type of dog. The median age is five years, so that's just the, the, the middle uh, age um, of, of affected dogs. The reason why it's not happening in, in puppies is because that degeneration takes time and it can occur from one year of age but generally it's in this kind of middle age category because then we've had the time for that disc to degenerate and over time that degeneration and that force going through there to cause the intervertebral disc extrusion. What I thought was slightly scary, and that's why I put it in this in this slide here, is some relatively recent data. Uh, how, this was in Scandinavia, showed that the lifetime prevalence, so that means the number of dogs who will be affected by at least one episode of intervertebral disc herniation, they didn't differentiate between the different types. It's one in five for the miniature dachshund. And of those, a quarter of them will die as a result of that. So that means 5% of all miniature dachshunds in this study died as a result of intervertebral disc herniation. That is incredibly high. And what's even more scary is that this is probably an underestimate because this only included those that were referred and were insured. So there probably are a huge number of dogs who are missed out in this data because they were treated in their primary care practice. There is also some slightly more recent data from the, the RVC and they suggested that actually the lifetime prevalence is more like 25%, so one in four, um, which puts that 5% even higher, up closer towards seven, seven and a half percent, which you know, is just a really scary thought. What does it look like? Well, I'm sure many of you have experienced this firsthand, but probably the signs start quite suddenly and, and initially progress a little bit over sort of one to three days. 
and the signs range from back pain on its own with absolutely no other deficits to complete paralysis and loss of feeling. Uh, we refer to that as loss of deep pain perception. Uh, but essentially that's loss of feeling. You'll, you'll see lots of vets pinching the, the toes really quite firmly and waiting to see whether they look around and acknowledge that we're, we're doing that to them. Um, and that's what we mean when they're saying loss of deep pain. Some dogs will also lose the ability to urinate. Some dogs will lose the ability to defecate as well without help. Um, and that's all part of this kind of sliding scale from back pain to paralysis um, that we, we, we often see. So what happens next? Um, it's, you know, we've got this wide range of, of, uh, of signs. We have this large number of dogs that are potentially affected. Well, it seems really logical. I've said before that we, we have a bruise and a bit like when uh, you bruise your leg or your arm or a muscle, there's not really any specific therapy. People have tried and, and to very little success to, to come up with specific treatments for the contusion. But actually we do have treatments that directly treat the compression because it, and it seems logical that, you know, if we've got a compressive problem, we should try to do that. And surgical decompression was introduced over 50 years ago. And over the last 50 years, it's been shown to be hugely, hugely successful. A lot of dogs undergo these operations and a lot of dogs do very, very well. There's a general perception, especially amongst the veterinary profession, that severely affected dogs require surgery. And not just require surgery, but re require surgery rapidly as well. And given this success of surgical management, it's very, very difficult for vets to recommend anything other than that. So conservative or medical management, because we know that surgical management has been so successful and it's tried and tested. It's very difficult when you have something that's tried and tested to go against that or to go with some alternative. The flip side of that is that we do know that many severely affected dogs will improve with non-surgical management. And there's never been any formal comparison of surgical and non-surgical management. It's quite difficult to do that, as you can imagine, you know, from an ethical point of view, when we know that surgery will do very well, it's, it's quite difficult to justify then not doing surgical management on dogs where that would be an option because you know we're potentially depriving them of a treatment which would give them very very good results so it, realistically that clinical trial probably can't happen there's also no robust criteria to, to distinguish patients that unequivocally require surgery there certainly are going to be dogs that unequivocally do require surgery. We just don't know necessarily who they are and which dogs could potentially get better with non-surgical management. That's kind of where we come in at Cambridge. Those are kind of the questions that we're trying to answer or at least get closer to answering. So what we're doing is we're looking for dogs who have become suddenly unable to walk on their back legs. So unfortunately, we can't include those dogs who just have back pain or who have back pain and some deficits, but are able to walk without any support. They have to be unable to walk and are suspected when they go to their vets to have an intervertebral disc extrusion in the middle of their back. This last bit here who cannot afford surgery is really important. Uh, because like I said before, we know that with surgery, they will do very well. So this is only for those where surgery is not an option due to cost. We would still be recommending surgery because it is the known in all of this. What will we do? Well, the first time uh, these patients come to us, they'll have a consultation. They'll have a full neurological examination with us. And as long as that is consistent with an intervertebral disc extrusion in that middle region of their back, we'll then admit them and they'll have an MRI under sedation to confirm the diagnosis of the intervertebral disc extrusion. That will also allow 
us to take some measurements. So we'll be taking some measurements on the MRI about degree of compression, length of compression, uh, and sort of intensity, so level of, of black or white on the MRI to hopefully be able to build up a few of these criteria that I was talking about earlier um, to decide who, who will do well and who won't. We'll then assist over 12 weeks with medical management. So that will entail a lot of rest, pain relief, physiotherapy, um, and various other things. Bladder management will be, be a large proportion of that. But you'll initially get a huge amount of help. You know, I will be on the phone every single day to, to, to patients who come in for this. So you'll have a huge amount of support, whether it be on the phone, by email, by video call, whatever it is that we can achieve, even with COVID kind of making that really difficult. We also liaise with your primary care practice. So if, if you've come from a, a very long way away, it still doesn't matter. We're still able to give a huge amount of support um, very successfully. The, the patients we've had so far have not come from, from, from close by and we've been able to give uh, really quite uh, good support, I think, um, through the whole 12 weeks. At the end of 12 weeks, we come back and we, we, we do all the same things again. So we do another consultation. We do another neurological examination to see how things have progressed. Uh, are there any deficits? If there are, what are they? And we also repeat the MRI. And the reason for that is we want to see has anything changed on that MRI? What has happened to that disc material that we haven't removed? Has it gone away? Is it still there? Has it changed in nature in any way, shape or form? And does that inform what we're then seeing clinically? Do certain changes uh, correspond to uh, a better clinical picture? So uh, that's kind of what I've written down here is what are our aims? Our primary aim is to determine what proportion of dogs will get better without surgery because we don't know that. That's the important first step to take. But this, the, the question we really want to answer is, is there anything that can help us predict that? Whether that be in our physical examination, neurological examination, or more likely on our MRI, that can inform us as to who is likely to get better without surgery and who will need surgery in order to get better. I want to show you our first case. Um, this is Lola. This is her not at the beginning of her, her, her treatment course, but actually quite a long way after the end of it. She was a four year, 10 month uh, female neutered miniature Datsun when she first came to us. She had had an episode of an intellectual disc extrusion at the beginning of the year, so four months before she came to us. And she had had surgery, she had surgery at another referral practice and she'd done very, very well. She'd almost completely recovered. She had very little uh, deficits remaining after that surgery. But then, unfortunately, she suffered another episode of an intervertebral disc extrusion. This started off with her having back pain and over 24 to 48 hours later, that then progressed and she became paralyzed. She also had no deep pain sensation. So um, she had no sensation in the back legs at all by the time she, she presented to her, to her vet. So she came to us, we did the consultation, we did the uh, neurological examination and that localised her to the right part of her back and, and we were very, very suspicious of an intervertebral disc extrusion. So she had an MRI which showed a, a disc extrusion between her last thoracic vertebra and her first lumbar vertebra, so sort of where the ribs meet the back. And this is her MRI. For those of you who aren't used to looking at it, it's a bit of an odd image. The one on the left, we have looking from the side. So the head is towards our left and the bum is towards our right. And on the right, we're sort of looking along the spinal cord. And if you look on the left, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can see these building blocks here that are kind of a grayish color. That's the vertebral body. In between, we have this kind of darker area. That's the intervertebral disc, this black area here. And running along the middle of the picture is our spinal cord. And you can see where the arrow points that there's this disruption in the spinal cord, this kind of irregular mottled appearance that isn't the same as the rest of the spinal cord. 
and that is the extruded material. That's the jam that's come from the donut. That is what is causing our problem. And on the other one, it's a little bit more difficult to appreciate. But if you can imagine here, there's not quite a nice defined uh, shape there. And that is, again, that, that kind of jam coming from the donut. And below, so the spinal cord, I'm just going around it with my cursor there. Below is the disc here, where all that material has come from. And I'm sure you can appreciate probably a bit easier from the, the image on the left. That this is actually taking up a large proportion of that canal. It's, it's compressing easily 50% of that canal. So th that we would put in the category of quite severely compressed. After 12 weeks, we did everything all again. So this is her MRI. So again, on the left, we're looking from the side, head to the left, thumb to the right. And on the right, we're looking end on. And you can see that actually there's still that compression. That I'm going around with my cursor there. So again, the building blocks of the vertebra here, disc here, disc here, spinal cord down the middle. And you can appreciate that this black area here, it's become a bit more organized uh, and a bit more clearly delineated but it's still well and truly there. So you might think that, well, that's not a very good sign. It's still there on, on this sideways image and it's still here, You can see, if you can see my cursor, it's still here on that end on image too. But we have a video here of Lola walking at the end of 12 weeks and I'm just gonna show you that now. So bear in mind that she was completely paralyzed when she came to us. She had no movement in those legs at all. At the end of 12 weeks, she was walking. Yes, she's a, a little uncoordinated, but I'm sure you can, uh, you'll all agree that that's really very good. I just want to play that for you one more time so you can all have a really good look at that. She's doing incredibly well there. That is quite a marked improvement over 12 weeks. And uh, since then, it's been another two or three months and she's continued to improve since then. And actually that picture that I showed you in that uh, previous slide, that's her just two weeks ago. Uh, her owner has another dachshund who's never had an intervertebral disc problem before and, and Lola now outruns her on her walk. So uh, a fantastic outcome for her. I'm going to take another sort of 10 minutes of your time just to uh, talk about some other areas of research that we're, we're looking into. Uh, hopefully that potentially everyone can help us with as well. So firstly, an intervertebral disc scoring scheme. Secondly, some uh, analysis of some disc material that we remove at surgery. And then lastly, I'll talk to you guys a little bit about gait analysis. So the intervertebral disc scoring scheme. So some of you will probably be aware of this already. It's been very widespread in Scandinavia, certainly. And what it entails is taking x-rays of the entire spine in dogs between two and four years of age. And then people who have been trained to do so count the number of calcified discs that they can see. And then they give a score based on that. And what we know is that there's a correlation between the number of disc calcifications seen when we do this and the risk of future extrusions later in life. We also know that that calcification is heritable. So that means that they can pass it on to their progeny. So if you breed two dogs who have a high number of, of disc calcifications on the x-ray, it's very likely that their offspring will also have that. That's why we make breeding recommendations based on this. So a grade is aside and the highest grade is for more than five calcified discs. And then we make breeding recommendations. Ideally, we're, we're breeding dogs who have much fewer than five calcified discs uh, there. This is available in the UK. Um, I'm sure Ian will correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I believe it's with Dovecot and, and, and the CVS practices. But when this kind of becomes a bit more widespread, we're going to include ourselves in that. And all of the dogs who are enrolled on this will have x-rays of their whole spine and will be scored in the traditional manner. But dogs who come to ourselves here at Cambridge at the Queen's Vet School Hospital and those who go to Dovecot referrals as well will have a CT done at the same time. And what we're aiming to compare is CT with x-ray because we believe and what we've shown with a small pilot study is that CT may be more sensitive for picking up these calcifications. Secondly, I want to talk to you about mineral content analysis. So this is something one of my colleagues, um, she's very kindly joined us here this evening, Teresa, is doing. And I spoke a little bit earlier about disc degeneration, and how discs can become calcified, and it's not necessarily clear the full process. We know a, a fair bit about it, but not everything. Uh, and we certainly don't know a huge amount about how it becomes calcified or the relevance of the calcification. And so what Teresa is doing is when we remove this material from doing decompressive surgery, she's taking that disc material and she's doing two different types of analysis. One is FTIR, it doesn't really matter what that stands for, uh, and, or electron microscopy. And that looks at the, the fine structure, the fine crystalline structure of this disc material. She's also then comparing that to disc material taken when we do something called fenestration. And those of you who speak French will know that fenestra means window, and that's kind of why we call it fenestration. It's making a window into other discs when we do the surgery and scooping out that soft gel-like material to try to reduce how likely we are to have future intervertebral disc extrusions. And so she's comparing the two there to try to see, is the crystalline structure different? Does it explain why it was that specific disc that was extruded? And does that calcification then correspond with the degree of spinal cord damage, with the prognosis, with whether those dogs required surgery or not, with the what we see on MRI? So there's a huge number of things that hopefully she's going to have a look at and hopefully find. And has the potential to be a really interesting area. So, so keep your eye on this kind of uh, stuff that Therese is doing. There's a reference there because it's been looked at in human medicine. So anyone wants, who wants to do some further reading, it's a good place to start. The last thing I wanted to talk to everyone about was TechScan gate analysis. TechScan is just the company that make the, the mat. And we use this mat, this is a picture of it here. And what it does is it measures the pressure. So dogs walk across it and we're able to track each of their steps and see how much of their weight they kind of put through each of their legs when they take each step. And what we're hoping to do is to use this analysis for two things. One is to try to understand why some dogs will spinal walk and some don't. And to also try to come up with some more objective measurements of recovery. And that's in dogs who have undergone both conservative and surgical management. It doesn't really matter because at the moment it's very much a subjective thing. that We look at them and we try to approximate. Um, and it's very reliant on experience, whether you've seen that dog walking before, you know, whether you've seen the full progression um, is it, it's very, very subjective. Whereas if we can get an actual number, an actual measurement that we can take that's non-invasive, it literally just requires them walking across a map, then that potentially is going to inform our choices and give us a better idea about where along the recovery pathway uh, we are. So hopefully that will be something else to look out for. Thank you everyone for listening. That's everything that I wanted to talk to you about. I can already see there's some questions popping up. Um, so any questions, uh, now is the time. Um, if you want to follow us and see what we're doing and keep up to date with any, any projects that we have going on, whether you're able to help or any case studies that we, we have, please follow us on Facebook at Cambridge IVDD. We also have some information on the Jackson Brew Council IVDD website and the University of Cambridge Department of Veterinary Medicine website also has some information about our projects that are currently recruiting. So 
feel free to look on all of those places to keep up to date with us. There's also a couple of references at the end here for anyone who wants to read a little bit more about anything that I've spoken about today. This isn't an extensive list of every paper ever, but it's just a, a, a good selection of everything that, that is out there that potentially somebody may want to read. So thank you again. Great, thank you very much, Sam. Really appreciate that presentation. Uh, just to remind people, we will uh, make the slides available on our Facebook page, Dax and Health UK, and uh, the video recording will be available probably over the next couple of days uh, for you to be able to, to view it at your leisure and share with other people who may want to see it through our Facebook group. Uh, we've had a couple of questions during the course of the presentation, which Paul Freeman answered. So I'm just going to pitch those back to Paul so that he can share the answers with everybody on that. So Paul, if you'd like to come off mute. Um, the, the first question was around why do we, why do we think the figures for uh, death are so high in the, in the Dachshund breed? Um, yeah, I think it's largely down to, um, I mean, most of those dogs are being euthanized, I would think, unfortunately, um, because of uh, either real or, or perceived uh, poor prognosis. Um, a small percentage of them, well, a, a, a reasonably significant percentage of them will, uh, after a, a severe extrusion, potentially suffer something called myelomalacia, which is where the spinal cord literally uh, becomes necrotic and, and, and uh, dies. And, and that sort of death of nervous tissue creeps up and down the spinal cord and, and is a really potentially quite a horrible uh, and, and completely untreatable condition. So some of them will be euthanized because of the onset of, of signs of that. Um, some of them will be euthanized because they don't recover. Um, and some of them, unfortunately, uh, and, and, you know, part of the driver for, for the research that we're doing really is to try and limit this one particularly. Some of them will be euthanized because people can't afford the treatment that they um, are told or recommended is, is essential. Um, and, uh, you know, the case that Sam mentioned, Lola, uh, uh, is a, a quite an interesting case in point because um, that case had obviously had surgery for a disc extrusion and then a few months later had a second one. And we know that, you know, recurrence rates are very high, uh, you know, maybe around 20, 25 percent. A lot of studies show um, of dogs that suffer an extrusion will suffer another one at some point, um, usually within a year or two. And, uh, you know, many people in the UK have insurance policies which will potentially pay for a first treatment but most of them won't pay for a second treatment so if all the money is used up on the first treatment and then another episode happens uh, you know sometimes unfortunately that leads to to euthanasia um, and you know if we we feel that if we can really try to identify a little bit better which of the dogs really need that expensive surgical treatment at their first uh, bout um, and, and perhaps try and limit the number that are having that a little bit um, compared to, to what's happening now so that there's potentially money left for a second episode which may be the episode that really did need the surgery um, so yeah I think it, it, unfortunately the death rate is, is, is largely down to, to you know euthanasia. Thanks Paul and the second question which you answered in the chat was um, do we um, what, uh, sorry, well, let me find it again. Uh, what medicine will be use, you using during that 12 week period for presumably for pain control? Yeah, it is really just the pain control that, that we're using, um, medications for. So, you know, most of the dogs, I mean, th these are quite painful conditions and, and certainly one of the, the sort of, I think very reasonable, um, recommendations for surgery is if we can't get on top of the pain. Um, because you know surgical treatment does tend to alleviate the pain quite quickly um, and uh, I think if you have a dog that, that we can't control the pain with medical treatment then that that is a reasonable indication to do surgery in some of these cases but most of them the pain can be brought under control relatively quickly usually within a few days um, certainly uh, so we use a combination um, of an anti-inflammatory drug something like uh, metacam for instance um, we put most of them on or all of them on gabapentin which is a drug that's particularly helpful for um, neurogenic pain 
Um, in the first few days, if we have them in and they're, they're acutely painful, then we may also add in some um, paracetamol uh, and uh, an opiate drug like methadone. Um, but most of them, when they're at home, will be on probably just gabapentin and uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and, and probably only need those drugs for a couple of weeks. Okay. And somebody, one of my colleagues from the health committee, <coughs> Jill, just picked up a, a point about the myelomalacea. Mm. Um, there's been some discussion amongst the admins on our Facebook group about that recently, that there seems to be more of a chance of recovery than perhaps was previously understood. Uh, suggestion that as soon as it's diagnosed, there's a tendency by some vets, particularly in general practice, to assume that euthanasia is the only option. Do you have a, a view or is there any data around that? I think that's come, that's come from a recent paper, actually. Um, and I, I think we have to be a little bit cautious how we interpret that. It's the, the, the genuine myelomalacia cases um, are horrible. Um, and I think the reason for recommending euthanasia is that these dogs tend to die of uh, breathing difficulties. Um, uh, they, they tend to be really quite sick and, and painful. And, uh, you know, I think... Um, not wanting to allow that situation to, to happen is, is very reasonable, um, actually, uh, reason to, to recommend euthanasia. I think we have to be a little bit cautious how we interpret that paper because the, the dogs that recovered with potentially myelomalacia, uh, you know, myelomalacia can only be uh, really confirmed at post-mortem. Um, and so just the fact that these dogs actually recovered throws a little bit of doubt on whether they genuinely had myelomalacia. Um, so I think, uh, you know, there, there are dogs that suffer a really severe um, intervertebral disc extrusion that will, will get a degree of malacia of the spinal cord associated with that contusive injury. So when the, when the jam explodes out of the donut and hits the spinal cord, it, it, it can do it in a powerful enough way to cause some loss of spinal tissue um, and, and, and that's basically what malacia is, it's death of spinal tissue. So you can get sort of a focal area of malacia in the middle of the spinal cord, which doesn't then extend up and down the cord. Whereas what we're talking about here is this so-called ascending, descending myelomalacia where the, the, the problem just creeps along the spinal cord. And that's why, you know, it gets into the, the chest, into the neck uh, eventually, and, and it will it will cause a, a fairly horrible death if it's left unchecked. So I think we have to be a little bit cautious about that. OK, thank you. Um, there's a number of questions from uh, Danny in the meeting, but I as she's uh, put a number. I'll come to one from Debbie de Jong in um, South Africa, which should be a very quick one. Uh, again, probably for Paul. Are there any daily supplements to maintain back health that you would recommend? Short answer, no. <laughs> okay, so we can move on to some. Many, but I just don't know of any that I would recommend. All right. Um, Debbie mentioned Mobiflex as a particular one. Um, I know in our last breed health survey, we focused on um, lifestyle factors. And I don't think there were any particular um, supplements that made any difference to the, the, the evidence or prevalence of no, there's anything, there's anything? There's nothing that there's any sort of real evidence for efficacy, put it that way. Okay, so first question from Danny. I could see on the CT scan, I think this one's for you probably, Sam. I could see on the CT scan there was bridging spondylosis in the late lumbar region. Are you looking at comorbid factors um, related to IVDD in your study as well? So that won't be our primary goal. So I think it's important to kind of differentiate between the two. So our primary goal is to look at the calcifications and correlate those. We will be recording other comorbidities and they will be in our data set for us to test if we feel like there's any difference. But it's not, it's sort of a secondary, uh, secondary goal, I guess, is, is the way to put it. So, yes, we will be recording it, but it's not our, our primary reason for doing it. Our primary thing that we'll be testing is, is to do with this calcification cell, comparing that to x-ray and then comparing that to lifelong incidents. So, sure. Sort of yes and no in a way. All right, thanks. And the second second Can question. I also just feedback uh, quickly on the uh, question about pain relief. The uh, other thing that I think um, Paul kind of alluded to as well, 
a lot of this that when we do when they're brought in uh, one thing I, I didn't really mention when I said that they come for their first visit we are also doing pain scores as well, which will inform a lot of our choices about medication. So absolutely cool. The, you know, we use anti-inflammatory like metacam and gabapentin. And then the need for opioids and things like that is determined by their, their pain score um, when they're here. So it's not just a subjective, we think they're paid for, it's an actual number that is not, uh, that is objective uh, and it informs those choices. Thanks, Sam. And there's actually a related question to that in terms of data collection from Bill Lambert. Uh, do you plan to collect any other data during your project, such as body condition score? Absolutely. So body condition score is a great example of ones that we definitely are taking. So we're taking quite a number of different measurements. Um, so from our initial physical exam and body condition score is one of them. So we're including things, very simple things like heart rate, body condition score, we're including all of the parts of our neurological examination. Every single part of it is, is there and available to being tested. So yes, uh, Bill, we're taking everything that we possibly can from this to see if there's anything that, that, that we can get any. And are you, me are you measuring um, length, height, ground clearance, leg length, all of those factors that Rowena Packer, for example, picked up and looked at in her study back in 2013? We, we aren't at this point in time. We're May, our main focus really is the is the MRI and things that would be very easy or quick for a vet to do in a relatively short time frame. So, say for the sake of argument, when they're coming into the, the practice, is there something that they can they can uh, they can look at really quickly, like body condition score that takes just a, a minute or so for them to do, or their neurological examination, which they're going to have to do anyway. So, without having to sort of go and take uh, a slightly more awkward measurement that they may not be used to doing. Okay, so what, one of the other questions, uh, again, Jill Key, um, and it's a discussion that often comes up amongst uh, Dax and exhibitors and breeders, the length of the rib cage, whether the dogs are long in the loin, uh, would be a really interesting measure to, to look at um, and see whether this is just folklore that the ones that have the the longer loin are maybe perhaps more prone to having back problems, but uh, we'll Absolutely. have to see the data to find out. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's something that we. It's Sorry. a slightly it's a slightly different question like, because I think the 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 sort of folklore is is you know that the length of the rib cage and the, the it, it makes them more prone to actually having an extrusion. Obviously, all our dogs that come in are gonna are gonna be dogs that have had extrusions or, or you know that they've, they've got to have had that in the first place. I think to, to find any real significant information about those kind of factors, you'd need to have a control group of dogs that didn't sure. have an extrusion. Um, so it's a little bit of a different question to to what we're looking at. I think. And what, okay. What? Yeah. Yeah. And another question uh, associated with the program, the treatment program, is it made clear to participants the length of time that it may take for their dog's recovery, i.e. don't expect quick results after 12 weeks? What sort of conversations will you be having with uh, participants in the Absolutely. study about that? So, so this takes up a, a large proportion of the conversation that we have from the very beginning, even before anyone comes to us. Uh, that it's going to take a long period of time, that it's not a quick fix, nothing is going to happen quickly. And it's a lot of, it's a, it, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint is the sort of cliche. And that's very much emphasized from the first moment that we're in contact uh, with people and emphasized at every step along the way. That this is even, even the 12 weeks is a fairly short period of time, really. So it, it's something that, very much from the beginning is is heavily heavily emphasized. And there's a sort of follow-on question from Marianne. Um, are those people supervising the patient's care blinded to the MRI data during the treatment period? No, no, they're not blinded. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think there's any uh, reason to do that because they're the the people that are uh, you know nursing. Well, Sam is primarily doing it anyway. Um, he, he's the one who's, while they're in the hospital, that's basically looking after them. Um, and I think in terms of the MRI data, really the, the only sort of information that anybody could have would be perhaps the, the degree of compression, shall we say, um, that, that's involved. So 
Um, I, I, I don't think there's a there's a need to to blind um, you know people in, in to that sort of thing in terms of, of what we're um, aiming to do uh, with okay. this. I, hmm. And there's another question from Danny. What's your advice on weaning a patient off gabapentin? To be honest, don't worry about it too much, um, given the length of time that they're generally on gabapentin and the sort of doses that we're using. We usually use a dose of sort of 10 mg per kg twice a day, and I've never, never had a problem with just stopping that, actually. Um, so I, I don't think there's a, there's a huge uh, worry there. Okay, and there's a question from Madalena. Uh, what about the dogs you decide not to do surgery on? Physi physiotherapy and acupuncture could help. So I guess this is into what sort of protocols and um, yeah. support you give to the dogs that aren't having surgical treatment. Yeah, we, 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 haven't, we haven't talked about acupuncture at all. Um, it is a conversation I'm actually having with our uh, relatively newly appointed head of anesthesia who, who um, uses acupuncture uh, for pain management. Um, and there is definitely some evidence out there that acupuncture um, can actually help uh, with spinal cord recovery, uh, recovery after spinal cord injury. And I, and I read a paper this week, actually, um, that uh, proposed a sort of molecular mechanism for how that might might be the case. So that, that's something that we haven't started looking at or doing. And, and, and potentially that's another trial altogether because we, we need to keep these dogs as, as relatively standardized as we can. Um, Marianne, who's in, in the corner of my screen, um, we're going to be having a conversation with after this, who's a, a rehabilitation practitioner um, uh, to, to basically help us to, to make sure that we're advising people uh, to, to use as standardized a sort of rehabilitation regime as possible to try and optimize that. Um, and that will involve, you know, some elements of physiotherapy, some elements of, of rehabilitation for sure. Um, yeah, I'm sort of looking okay. down the other questions. Okay, so there's another, there's a question from Angie about is weight and stamina a factor? And uh, some of you may be aware of the lifestyle survey that we did back in 2015. So if you have a look on www.daxand-ivdd.uk, you can find the results of that uh, study. And there was a peer reviewed paper published on that. And there are factors like exercise and uh, body condition that are summarized in there. Paul, I don't know whether you want to just make an observation based on what you see in practice. In terms of uh, dogs, that, body dogs, that, dogs that are overweight or lacking in muscle tone or body condition. Yeah, I think to what I extent think, you think that's an issue? I mean, you know, just just on the published work, you know, that I, I think it was very interesting the the, the paper that um, showed that actually exercise uh, was potentially um, preventative or at least reduced the risk of, of disc extrusions uh, in, in Datsuns. Um, and I think, you know, as with uh, people, there is definitely evidence that, that um, uh, dogs and people that are exercising in a, in a certain way, and I think that's perhaps the thing that we don't really know what, what might be uh, the optimal exercise to maintain um, disc and, and back health and, and you know intuitively you would think that the more weight that they're carrying the more likely they are to have problems I think what we we don't really know that for a definite factor but what we do see for sure is that the overweight dogs take longer to recover um, and, and struggle with their recovery and that that's probably the biggest factor I think whereas um the, uh, the you know the, the slim lighter ones tend to get up more quickly understandably um, another factor we've been talking about just today is the temperament of, of uh, dachshunds and I'm sure many of you will, will be aware you know we we tend to find that they all fall into two camps you know the ones that uh, you know you can't hold them back they're just raring to go from the word uh, go really and then there are the others that just want to lay there and be carried out to the grass and and, and just continue to lay there and you know, that potentially may have an impact on, on um, you know, at least how quickly they'll recover. I think the whole question of speed of recovery is, a, you know, is another interesting factor because one of the things that people always say is that surgical treatment will lead to a more rapid recovery um, than medical treatment. And, and that may well be true, but we haven't actually got any solid evidence to show that. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're one thing Sam didn't really mention, but we are monitoring very closely 
how long it takes um, our dogs to to get back on their feet and walk again. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's going to be interesting data as well, uh, because it's it's one thing to sort of explain to people that it might take a long time, but it's another thing to get people being willing and able to, to continue for that long period of time. So, you know, speed of recovery is important as well, I think, in terms of limiting the number of dogs that, that get put to sleep. Okay. Folks, I'm conscious that it's just gone eight o'clock and we said this would be a 60 minute webinar and we're really grateful to Sam and Paul for their inputs this evening. So I think we've pretty much covered all the questions. I may have missed one or two in the chat. If so, I do apologize and we will try and get answers to those um, into uh, the Facebook group. So it really just remains for me to say a really big thank you to Paul and to Sam and wish you every success with this research program. I know it's being supported by funding from the Kennel Club Charitable Trust and Dachshund Health UK, which is our charity, is also supporting this program financially. So if there's anybody attending the webinar this evening, if you would like to make a donation towards our charity, Dachshund Health UK, we would be immensely grateful. And you can know that that donation will go towards this research and actually making a difference to uh, the health and welfare of Dachshunds in the future. So on that note, I will wrap up. I will stop the recording and say good evening and thank you very much to everybody. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye.